Okay, again, there are handouts there in the back if you want to grab one to uh, follow along with the class this morning. We are studying this, uh, this quarter uh, starting today, and uh, there will be 10 classes, 10 classes that are a part of this particular series uh, where we're going to be talking about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And uh, this, is a, uh, this is a topic that is not discussed too often. Uh, it, and especially not as much uh, detail and uh, information that we'll be going through, and, and that's for a variety of reasons, but uh, this is a topic that we need to know about. And so the senior high class uh, is not meeting uh, in their classroom on Sunday mornings this quarter. Senior high should be in here. I see some of them here. Uh, the young adult class is, uh, is not meeting uh, this quarter. Uh, on their own. They're being encouraged to be in here as well uh, because this is a topic that uh, affects all of us but uh, especially is going to impact uh, those who are in high school and those who are young adults. Uh, Those who uh, are in that age group, they're going to be affected by this even more uh, than those of us who are are older. But it's a topic that is uh, one that is uh, can be controversial. and yet it's a topic that we need to know what the Bible says. This is having a tremendous impact uh, in the church. And uh, we need to be aware of, of what Scripture says. And so if you've got a handout, I want to go through that this morning. And uh, most of this information should be up on the screen for you to fill in any blanks that we have. There's a lot of material that we're going to try to cover in each class uh, as, that's a part of this 10-week series uh, and so uh, we'll try to, we won't be able to cover everything that's, uh, that's in your handout. There's more information there than we'll be able to discuss, uh, but that's for you to be able to take home and have for further study. But this, this particular study, when we talk about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, this is, a, uh, this is a study that's of critical importance. And it's of a critical importance for a variety of reasons. One, because it has eternal significance. This is not something that's just, well, if I get it right or if I get it wrong, it really doesn't matter. It's not something that that we can say, well, you know, we can believe whatever we want to believe, and at the end of the day, it it really has no significance. This matter is one of eternal significance. What does that mean? My relationship on this earth, my earthly relationship with my spouse has a direct impact on my relationship with God. And my relationship with God has a direct impact on whether I go to heaven or not. That's an eternal significance. I need to know what the Bible says about marriage and divorce and remarriage because it's going to affect where I spend eternity. This is a, uh, not just a matter of, of eternal significance. This is a matter of national significance. If you look around... Our, uh, our nation today, what kind of respect does our nation today have for God's laws on marriage? Uh, I would say none. Uh, they, there, is, there is very little concern today about what the Bible says about marriage. And for sure what the Bible would say about divorce and remarriage, but they're not even concerned about marriage as it is. And yet you look at our nation and as you look at at na- as you look at the world history, nations tend to go in the same direction that the home and marriage and the family go. Marriage and the family is very much the foundation of any nation. And so if the marriage and the family crumbles, what's going to happen to the nation? Well, it's going to crumble. Is the foundation of our nation in jeopardy? For a number of reasons, probably, but no doubt one of those reasons is because of where our world is today and where our society is today on this particular subject. Not only has eternal significance and national significance, this is a matter of church significance. Uh, I just spent, uh, spent the week up at uh, an event that's called Polishing the Pulpit. Uh, there were 3,200 Christians uh, from all over gathered up in, uh, in Sevierville, Tennessee for an outstanding event, uh, an event that I would encourage all of you to go to. It's not just for preachers, uh, it's for everybody. And uh, if you go to uh, polishingthepulpit.com and look at the, the schedule that they had for this year, 
Uh, you would love to be there. You ought to go next year. But here was an event with 3,200 Christians there. And one of the topics that was discussed was this matter of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Because as this is having an impact on our nation, well, it's going to have an impact on the church. The church is not immune. Christians are not immune to this issue. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that this, that this, uh, that this issue is not going to impact you. It's going to have an impact on you. And so we need to be aware of... Uh, we need to be aware of what the Scripture teaches and, uh, and to make sure that we're not leaving the laws and the morality of God behind uh, in order that we might uh, uh, fulfill our own uh, desires. Go, go to the, I know this is where some of you are going to spend some of your time, so we might as well look at it. Go to the third page of your handout. Go to the inside, and uh, if you don't have a handout, make sure you grab one from the back. But uh, there are listed uh, on, uh, on the third page of your handout the very last thing uh, that is here. There are some, uh, about 21 different uh, views of this particular issue of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. There are 21 uh, different positions that people take on this particular issue. And this isn't people in the world, it's people in the church. Uh, these aren't things, and these aren't things that are just made up. These are real uh, beliefs, opinions, uh, positions that people take. And we'll just read through these so that you can understand why this topic is so important. There are those who believe that marriage is merely a cultural development that has evolved over the years. It wasn't from God. It was just culture that brought this about. There are some believe, who believe that living together, uh, that, that's an acceptable and advisable uh, thing to do before you ever get married or even if you do get married. Number three, having an open marriage where you're free to have sexual relations outside the marriage. Some would say that's healthy. You know, that, that shows that you have a good, healthy relationship. Number four, there are people who believe that homosexual marriages are equally as legitimate as heterosexual marriages. There are those who believe that the practice of polygamy is biblically uh, authorized and approved. There are those, and, and starting with letter F, number six on this and going down, these, this is where we're going to spend a lot of our time in these ten weeks. There are those who believe that God's marriage laws do not apply to non-Christians. If you're not a Christian... You don't have to worry about God's marriage laws. There are those who believe, the, and these are Christians. There are those who believe that God's marriage laws that are found in Matthew 19, 9 are, are not actually a part of the New Testament law, and so they don't apply to Christians. And yet you look at the next one, and there'd be another group of people who would say that God's marriage laws in Matthew 19, 9 only apply to Christians. They call it a, a covenant passage. There are those who believe that, marriage, that divorce and remarriage is permitted for any cause. And then you look at the next one, and there would be other people in the church today who would say that divorce and remarriage is not permitted for any cause. So it's permitted for every cause. Oh, it's not permitted for any cause. There would be some who would say that whatever divorce, uh, whatever marriage or divorce the civil law permits, whatever the law of the land says is okay, that's okay with God. There would be some who would say everyone has a right to be married. doesn't matter what's happened in their past. Everybody has a right uh, to be married. There would be some who say that death is the only cause. The only reason somebody can get remarried is if their spouse dies. There are some in the church who say that baptism washes away all divorces and remarriages. And if you're living in adultery, it, 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 uh, it cleanses you from that relationship. And letter O is similar to that. And that a person may abide in whatever marital relationship they are in once they become a Christian. doesn't matter what's in their past. They can abide, stay in whatever relationship they're in because Christianity has sanctified that relationship. There are some letter P that say that repentance only requires that somebody be sorry and promise never to, never to do it again. And then they can go about whatever they're doing as long as they're sorry and they promise ne never to do it again. There are some who would say letter Q that adultery means only covenant breaking. There are some of the church who say it has nothing to do with sexual activity. It's, it's just a matter of covenant breaking and after that all you have to do is pray, ask forgiveness and you can remarry as long as you want. There would be some who would say that a Christian may remarry if uh, his or her non-Christian spouse leaves him. If you're a Christian, you're married to a non-Christian. If that non-Christian leaves you, you can get remarried. There would be some who would say that divorce and remarriage is permitted for viewing pornography. There would be some who would say that a spouse guilty of fornication may remarry. And there would be some who would say that divorce and remarriage is only permitted for that innocent spouse who puts away his or her mate for fornication. What does the Bible teach? Here's more than 20 different opinions Here's more than 20 different views 
about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Can all of these be right? Uh, they can't all be right because some of them, many of them are in direct opposition to each other. They can't all be right. What does the Bible teach? This is something that has eternal significance. It's not a question, it's not a question of, well, that, that's your belief and I've got my belief and let's just agree to disagree. This is going to impact whether I go to heaven or not. It has a national significance, has a church significance, it has a biblical significance. When we study this particular topic, it, this, isn't about, this isn't about what does David believe about this. This isn't about what, is the, what do the elders believe about this. This isn't about what does the church of Christ believe about this. This is a matter of biblical significance. Marriage is not something uh, that our culture invented. It's something that God invented. So we need to know what God has to say about it. Lest I forget to mention this at the end of class, I plan to, but I'm, I may forget or run out of time. As we've read through those, if there were 21, as we've read through those 20 or 21 different views that people have of marriage, divorce, and remarriage, that's not exhaustive. Uh, that was just as many as I could fit on that page. But uh, there are other varying degrees of all of those positions that people would have. And perhaps you've talked to some individuals. And uh, if you have any questions about marriage and divorce and remarriage. If you have any questions that you would like to have an answer to, if you have any questions that you would like uh, to see included in this class, if you will uh, write those down, uh, give those to me or send me an email, send me a text, uh, send me an old-fashioned letter in the mail and put a stamp on it. Uh, you know, it, if, if you've got something you'd like included in the class, uh, get that to me and uh, we'll try to include as many of those as we can uh, as we go through this study. But here is a topic that is admittedly a very sensitive topic. Um, very sensitive. Why, why is it sensitive? It's sensitive because this is a topic that touches everybody. This is a topic, this is a subject that everybody is touched by. It may be that you are personally touched by this and that you have been involved in a marriage and then a divorce and perhaps even a remarriage. That, that, that's a very personal aspect. Or your parents have, or your siblings have, or your children have. Or this is not something that, that we can think, well, I just, I just don't know anybody that this involves. It Everybody is touched by this. And what that means is that... What? Interesting to note, when I was early teens... When, a couple years ago, when Joe was early teens... I did not know anybody who had divorced. Joe did not know anybody. Oh, that, he didn't put a period there. He didn't know anybody. He didn't know anybody who had been divorced. Now, that's just, you know, that's just a few years ago. Um, and, and look at what's happened. This is something that's very sensitive because what happens when we know somebody who has been divorced and remarried is we want them to be okay. We want their remarriage to be okay with God. And we don't want to have to say, we don't want to be in a place to say, we don't even want to think that maybe they're wrong that maybe they don't have a right to be remarried. And remember, this has eternal significance, that the fact that they've remarried somebody could cost them their soul. Sometimes when parents look at their own children, and their own children have been involved in being divorced and remarried, well, they don't want to say that their children have done something wrong. They don't want to say their children have now placed their soul in jeopardy. And so sometimes they try to find a way to justify what they've done. Those positions that we read through on the third page of your handout, the reason that many of those positions, the reason that many of those beliefs have come into existence, it's not because the Bible teaches them, but it's because someone has found themselves in a situation 
where they wanted, felt compelled to say, well, that, that marriage is okay. Because after all, as our world believes, everybody's got a right to be happy, right? Doesn't everybody have a right to be happy? Doesn't everybody have a right to, to, to go through life and, and live life in a way where, where all is well and all is good? And, and Well, if everybody's got a right to be happy, then everybody's got a right to be married. And everybody's got a right to be married to whoever they want to. You know, as, as long, is, that, is that true? If that's true, then why does the Bible talk about marriage and divorce at all? Why would the Bible even discuss the matter if it really doesn't matter? And so as we go through this topic this quarter, I, I recognize and I want all of us to recognize the sensitive nature uh, of this topic. Uh, the fact that it is a, it is a controversial uh, matter, so much so that congregations have been divided over this issue. Families have been divided over this issue. And so as we approach it uh, in, over these next uh, 10 weeks, we need to recognize that God's law cannot be set aside for our own personal preferences. We've got to get into the Word of God and we've got to uh, study it properly. And so here's what I want us to look at. Point three, four, and five on your handout. The one on the first page and then the next two. Here are three things that when we come to this study, three things that we've got to bring with us. Three, uh, three understandings, three attitudes that we've got to have. Um, and that first one is that when we approach this, we've got to have the proper attitude. Um, attitude. The, the word attitude can have a very negative connotation, can't it? Uh, you look at your kids and you say, get rid of that attitude. You ever said that? Um, that's a negative connotation. You've never said, when they came up and gave you a hug and kissed you and said, happy birthday, I love you, did you say, get rid of that attitude? Well, it depends, you know, depends on what kind. Of, but most of the time when they have a good attitude, you don't yell at them for having a good attitude. When we talk about somebody having an attitude, it's always negative, right? Um, well, that's not necessarily negative here. When we, approach, when we approach what the Bible says about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, we need to come to the Bible with the proper attitude. We need to come to the Bible with the proper attitude towards marriage itself. And when we do that, we need to recognize that this is not a product of our culture. It is a product of God. And since it's a product of God, it must be respected as a product of God. We need to have the proper attitude towards marriage itself. We need to have a proper attitude towards God himself. Somebody might say, wow, how, how would you ever not have a right attitude towards God? Remember, this is a very sensitive subject. It's a very controversial subject. It's a subject that we want everybody to be right. We want everybody to be okay. We don't want to say anybody has made a decision and put themselves in a position or a situation that's going to jeopardize their soul. And yet if we try to justify everybody, what kind of respect are we showing towards God? We've got to have the proper attitude uh, towards God. And that, 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 whoops, that comes in, in all of these different forms here. Our love for God has got to supersede our love for anybody else. And that's hard. I know some of you are going to the second page of your handout. Don't, don't, don't lose me just because you've gone to the second page. Our love for God must supersede our love for everybody else. Jesus said, He who comes after me, if he does not hate his father, his mother, his wife, his brothers, his sisters, his own children, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus said, you've got to love me more than everybody else, including your own parents, your own children, your own spouse. We can't seek to justify somebody and say, well, I, you know, they, our love for God's got to come first. Our submission to God has got to come first. And when you take our love and our submission and you bring them to our, uh, to our relationship with God, we've got to recognize that that needs to bring about true repentance. 
We're going to talk this quarter about what does repentance mean? Not just what does it mean, but once we understand what it means, what does it require? One of those positions that we read is, well, repentance is just being sorry and saying you won't do it again. Is that what repentance is? That's not the way the Bible defines it. And so we need to take our love for God, our submission to God, and when we come before God, be ready to truly repent where that's needed. And then we need to be very careful, and I want you to to think about this last point here. We need to make sure that our respect for God does not allow us to improperly invoke the love and the mercy of God in a way that He doesn't authorize. What does that mean? What does it mean that we should not improperly invoke the love and mercy of God in order to justify somebody's relationship? It's very common. It's very common in the discussion of marriage and divorce and remarriage for someone to say, well, where does the grace of God come in? Where does the mercy of God come in? Where does the love of God come in? And specifically, if it's discussed that someone is living in adultery, someone might say, yeah, but, you know, where, where's God's grace in this? Where's God's mercy? Where's God's love? Doesn't God love them? Doesn't God's grace, if they're a Christian, isn't God's grace there for them? Even if they're... You see what we're doing? We are invoking, taking... God's love, His mercy, and His grace saying, well, shouldn't it be over here for this person? Well, it should be. But does God, does God just pour out His grace and His mercy on everybody and anybody who ever asks for it? Or are there conditions that we've got to meet in order to be recipients of that grace and that mercy? Remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 6, shall we consent, continue in sin that... Grace may abound. Boy, if, 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 where do we get grace? Well, we get it when we sin. Great. more we sin, the more we get grace, good deal, right? That's not the way it works. God's grace comes with conditions that we've got to meet. And so let's make sure that our love and our submission and, and our devotion and respect for God doesn't cause us to uh, improperly invoke uh, His mercy where, where He's not extending it. We've got to have the proper attitude when we come to study... Uh, God's Word, we've got to have a proper attitude towards His Word. We've got to respect the fact that God's Word is perfect. When I come and I pick up my Bible, and I look at what my Bible says about about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, is what the Bible says perfect? Yeah. Is it complete? Yes. Is God going to supply me with everything that I need on this particular subject? If He has supplied us, in 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, if He has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, does that include this particular subject? Has He given us all that we need in this area? Yeah. The proper attitude I need to have is one that goes and seeks truth. And it takes all of my prejudices, it takes all of my personal beliefs, it takes all of my preferences takes all of my opinions, and when I go to seek truth, I take all of those other things and I put them aside. All of those preconceived ideas. Well, here's what I think God should say. No, not, I take that and I put it aside because my, the proper attitude I'm going to have towards the Bible is I'm, I'm going to seek the truth. Because the Bible says that truth can be known. And truth can be understood. It, it, it's, it's not... It's not some complicated uh, system that God's given to us. Truth is, not, truth, is, truth is not complicated. God has not made it complicated. Unfortunately, man has sometimes made it complicated. When we looked at those positions and you see ones that are, that are diabolically opposed to each other, that, that, uh, that here, nobody can remarry uh, for any cause and then everybody can remarry for any cause. The, well, Those can't both be right. They're saying two different things. I come and I seek truth and I remove preconceived ideas. And when I do that, I recognize that this book can be known. It can be understood and it must be obeyed. But before we go on. 
from this one, I want you to see that there are some consequences to sin. There are some consequences to sin that we need to understand are not alterable. You can't change them. We're not talking about forgiveness here. We're talking about consequences that we reap as a result of our actions. Galatians 6 and verse 7 says that, what, what does it say? God is not mocked. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows... What? That's what he's going to reap. And if I live my life and I'm sowing and making decisions and I'm doing certain things, God says, I'm going to reap what I'm sowing. Now, we, usually we think about that in a bad sense, right? Uh, think, same thing with attitude. We see that as negative. Does sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping, does that work in a positive way too? If you sow good things, what are you going to reap? Well, you're going to reap good things. It, it works both ways. But if, but if I make decisions that are contrary to God's will, well, there are eternal significance to that fact. There, there are eternal consequences. I'll separate myself from God. But are there other earthly consequences to those actions? There are earthly consequences. And sometimes those earthly consequences cannot be altered. If I live my life in such a way that I have been uh, very free and loose in my sexual activities and I end up getting AIDS, but then I become a Christian. I learn the gospel and I, I change my life. I repent and I'm baptized and I wash away my sins. Has God forgiven me? Yes. Are there some consequences that still exist based upon my previous actions that have not been removed? Yeah. Does that mean that God doesn't love me? Does that mean that God hadn't forgiven me? Does that mean that I don't have the grace of God? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means there's consequences to our actions that sometimes cannot be changed. It doesn't mean that those things will uh, necessarily separate us from God, but it means that we have decisions to make, even after we become a Christian, that we need to make sure that it's in, in, uh, in accordance with the will of God. We've got to have that proper attitude, proper attitude towards marriage, proper attitude towards God, proper attitude towards His Word, and uh, the proper attitude uh, as we approach God and His Word towards one another. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a topic where we can easily get mad at each other. This is a topic where we can easily uh, start pointing fingers and being ugly and, uh, and uh, being unkind towards each other. Some of you are smiling like you agree that that might be the case. Um, what does the Bible tell us about the proper attitude that we need to have towards each other? It needs to be an attitude of agape love. An attitude that says, I'm going to put you and your needs and your interests even above my own. And I'm going to treat you the way that Jesus would treat you. I'm going to treat you the way that I would want to be treated. And so not just in the class setting, but in any setting where we get involved in any study, but particularly on this study, uh, we need to make sure that we understand um, what our response needs to be towards each other. Uh, that we give preference to one another, that we love one another as God would have us to do. Third, uh, the second thing, we need to have a proper attitude. And when we enter into this study, we need to make sure that we have the proper authority. This is critical. Um, and this, this may be, well, I'll, I can't say this is the most important section, but this is, this is critical that that we establish this as our foundation for this study. Otherwise, uh, it's not, it's not going to work. It's not going to make any, any, it's not going to be any good if we don't understand this as our foundation. What is our standard on anything? But what is our standard? What is our authority in the area of marriage, divorce, and remarriage? In other words, how do we decide what's right? Well, we could base everything upon our fickle emotions. 
We can base everything upon our emotions. And guess what? We do that a lot, don't we? As you see on your handout, there are times, not just in life, but even in Christianity, even within the church, there are times when we look at some things and we say, boy, that just doesn't seem fair. God, that doesn't seem right. Nope, nope, nope. It sure doesn't. God, God, that just doesn't seem fair. And this comes into play so often in the subject of marriage, divorce, divorce and remarriage. It doesn't seem fair that they can't be married. It doesn't seem right that they have to get divorced. What are we doing? We're making our emotions the authority when we say those things. We're making our emotions the standard. Well, that just doesn't seem right to me. You look at some of those scriptures that are listed under there and, and ask those individuals, did it seem right? Did it seem fair to them? In Ezra chapter 10, when the Israelites were told to put away their foreign wives, that didn't seem right. That didn't seem fair. When Achan, remember Achan stole those things from the city of Jericho? Was Achan put to death for that? Yes. Was Achan the only one put to death? His family, his children, well, that doesn't seem fair. That doesn't seem right that, that you would put to death his children. What are we doing? We're taking our emotions. We're making those the standard. And that's never right. Sometimes our emotions elevate themselves and prevail in situations where in a similar way we might say, that doesn't make sense. You ever studied with somebody and that was their response? That just doesn't make sense to me. I, I, I don't understand that. Be baptized for the remission of your sins? That, that doesn't make sense. So does that mean you don't have to be baptized because it doesn't make sense? When, when God told the Israelites to go and take the city of Jericho, what were they to do in order to conquer the city of Jericho? March around it. Once a day for six days, seven times on the seventh day. God, that just doesn't make sense. You know, I've seen a lot of battle strategies, but God, that one just doesn't make sense. So what do you do? You don't do it? Because God said, it, when, when Naaman was told, go dip in the Jordan River seven times, what did he say? That doesn't make sense. Are you kidding me? Dip in the Jordan. What are we doing? We're taking our fickle emotions. We're taking our thoughts and our emotions. We're saying, these are more Important. These make more sense. These are more authoritative than what God says. Would Naaman have been cleansed if he didn't dip in the Jordan River seven times? No. Well, it doesn't make sense to me, God. Would the walls of Jericho fallen down if they weren't marched around as God? No, it wouldn't have. Well, God, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter if it makes sense to us. What matters is, what does God say? And if I go and do that, it doesn't matter if it seems right or fair to me. It's right or fair when God commands it. Our emotions, they're not qualified. They're not qualified to be our, to be our standard. Jeremiah 10 and verse 23, the Bible says, It is not in man who walks to direct his steps. We couldn't guide ourselves to heaven if our life depended on it. We've got to have the authority of God. And our emotions cannot determine or change what the Bible teaches. Sometimes the standard, the authority that's used by people are their family situations. If it's not fickle emotions, it's family situations where, again, somebody's family, maybe even themselves or someone close to them, their parents, their children, their loved ones, they get themselves involved in a, in a marriage situation and somehow we want to make that the standard. We don't, we don't want to worry so much about what the Bible says. We just want to make that the standard so that they're okay. Does the Bible say what it means? Does it mean what it says? And just because our family, just because a loved one does something different than what this book says, do we have a right to try to justify them in that? If we have a family member who's not baptized into Christ, and they die, and we've all had those. Loved ones who've never been baptized for the mission of their sins and they die, you know what we want to do? 
We want to find some way to justify, to rectify. We want to find some way so that they're saved. Can I change what the Bible says about baptism is for the remission of sins? I can't change that. When a family member, and some of you are in this situation, when a family member turns to a homosexual lifestyle, can we all of a sudden change what the Bible says about homosexuality and alter it a little bit just so that they're okay? Just so that they're not condemned? That, that can't become the standard, can it? A family situation cannot be made to be the standard. There is a standard and there is an authority and that's in the Word of God. And I can't change that. And my family situation won't change that. Sometimes some people look uh, to their fellow brethren to be their standard. They look around and uh, they say, well, I, I've done, a, I've done a, a scientific poll and there are more people in the church who agree with me than, a, than don't agree with me, so I must be right. Is that a good, is that a good way to go? I mean, it, you come down here and you'd find more people who, who believe that, that the gators are, are something than you would find in Birmingham, wouldn't you? Is that a good way to go? To, to try to, to say, well, who agrees with me? That's, that's, not always a good, that's not always a good, if everybody agrees with you, is that always a good thing? Uh, is that our standard? Some people go preacher shopping. And uh, they want to go preacher shopping and find a preacher who agrees with them. Because they think, boy, if I can find a preacher who agrees with what I believe about this, <laughs> that's a ticket to heaven. I mean, if there's nothing else that's a ticket to heaven, if I get a preacher that agrees with me, pff, done deal. It's okay. And with the internet today, with, uh, uh, with websites today, that's even easier to do. Because all you got to do is type it in. All you got to do is Google it. Oh, there's somebody who agrees with me. Perfect. I'm free and clear. No problems. No. Our fellow brethren are not the standard. So if it's not our fickle emotions, if it's not our, uh, our family situations, if it's not our fellow brethren, what is our standard? What is it that is our authority? There's only one. And it's this book. It is absolutely flawless. You know, this, this topic of marriage, divorce, remarriage, the very first line of your handout on that first side indicated that this is not a trivial matter. This isn't, well, you know, if we get it right, if we get it wrong, it really doesn't matter. It's not something trivial. This is of eternal significance. So much so that I've got to come to this book and understand that this book is the only objective authority. Huh. Are our family situations, are those objective authorities? No, that's as subjective as they can get. Are our emotions objective? No. Are, are our fellow brethren, is that an objective authority? Nothing is an objective authority except for the perfect will of God. And this has got to be the book that we come to because this is going to be the book that judges us. We've got to have the proper authority when we come to this, stu uh, this study. We've got to have the proper attitude. And we don't have time to develop this in the way that we need to. And I knew we wouldn't. And that's why I put it all there on your handout for you. But when we understand the proper attitude we need to have. And we understand the proper authority, the word of God that we've got to use. When we come to the word of God, we must use the proper analysis. Uh, last year. Last year we spent, I don't know how many weeks, a lot of weeks on Sunday nights talking about interpreting the Bible God's way. And if I could, I would just take that Sunday night series that we did last year and insert it right here. That's what this is, is to understand that when we come to the Word of God, we can't come to it in the way that we want to come to it. We've got to come to it in the way that God tells us to come to it. We've got to have the proper analysis of the Word of God. Understanding that it is inspired, it is the perfect will of God. Understanding I don't have a right to add to it or take away from it. Understanding that when I study it, I don't need to enforce my ideas into it. I need to let the text tell me what it says in its content and in its context. And when I've studied everything the Bible says, gathered all the relevant evidence, and I handle it correctly, then I need to take everything that it says and hold only 
to what the Bible says is true. And if I find a position that somebody holds or even uh, even a position that I myself have held, is it possible that you could come to the Bible after years and years of study and learn that something that you have believed for years and years is not right? Uh, Yeah, because it's not in man who walks to direct his steps. Here is the Word of God. And here's the word. What what does 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 say? Does it say this book is profitable? It's profitable for doctrine, teaching. Tell me what's right. It's profitable for reproof. Tell me what's wrong. It's It's profitable for correction. It tells me how to get right with God. What does that mean? Well, I've been wrong. It's profitable for instruction in righteousness. It tells me how to stay right with God. This has got to be our standard. And I've got to have the proper analysis when I come to it. Let's finish with this section. Some keys. And don't, don't close up on me. I've got 42 more seconds, right, John? Don't close up on me. Listen. And th- these, are, these are significant points. Marriage is sacred. Not some flippant relationship that we enter into just because it's fun. God created it. God regulates it. It is is sacred. The Bible is our only standard. It must be taught, it must be respected, and it must be obeyed. And I want you to see letter D and letter E. What the Bible teaches about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, it's not actually complicated. It's not complicated. It's not cloaked. It's not hidden. It's not difficult. It's not contradictory. If you get in and study what the Bible says about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, it's rather straightforward, systematic, and it's rather simple. It's just man that has made it complicated. So as we go through this study this quarter, I hope we'll keep these fundamental principles and introductories and uh, introductory matters and thoughts in mind. Again, if you have any questions or thoughts, or uh, things that you would like to see included in this class. We only have 10 weeks. We're not going to be able to study everything. We won't be able to look at every point. But if there's something you'd like to know or have included, uh, please get that to me, and we'll try to include that in the class. Thank you so much for your good attention this morning.